another Red Chair Chat. Today I have Elise Ellis with us. Thanks for being here, Elise. Hey, you're welcome. So tell me a little bit about yourself, how long you've been in real estate, and maybe what you did before getting into real estate. Okay, so I, um, well, it's kind of a two-fold story. Okay. So I was originally licensed in 2005, and I had just gotten married, and I was pregnant with my first child, and when that first baby came along, I was like, holy cow, this is a whole different world, whole different uh, way of living and it was exciting yeah. and I let my real estate license go I just oh. couldn't focus on a new baby newly married and running a business mm -hmm. at the same time and how long did you have it licensed 2005 till oh 2007 probably wow so like right before mm -hmm. a crash yeah. going through it and then yeah. you let it go I'll okay let it go. Yeah. so then you did you just stay at home mom during that time no I was okay. actually um, a social media coordinator for an international oh, brand cool. mm -hmm. That's yeah awesome. so I did all their Facebook Instagram when Instagram came out because that was the beginning of Instagram yeah. um, blogging Twitter, all the things, wow. anything social media in the very infancy of social media. Okay, so then when did you get licensed again? In 2015. Okay, and what made you want to make that change into getting licensed? So the company I was working for was uh, my family business. My parents owned the business. And in 2011, my dad sold that business. Mm -hmm. And he stayed on for the next three years. And as uh, he was transitioning out of the business, I started seeing things that we call red flags, that things that I didn't like. I yeah. th started seeing things <laughs> happening that I didn't like that I wasn't comfortable with. And at that same time, in those three years, so from 2011 to 2014, mm -hmm. we tried to sell our house. And we had a contract in the first two weeks, and then that contract fell through, and we stayed, we took it off the market, mm -hmm. let it expire, and then put it back on in 2012 when I got a call from Zach Riggs. Mm -hmm. So... Zach called us on an expired listing, and I was not nice <laughs> to him. I, was not, I wasn't mean. I was yeah. just very, very matter of fact, very direct. This is what I expect. This is, I want, if I want to work with you, these are the things I expect. And he said, okay, let's do it. And I said, okay. <laughs> and we just. That was the easiest yes. <laughs> yeah, it was the easiest yes. And um, so we had, uh, we put it back on the market in 2012, mm -hmm. and the house did sell. Okay. So fast forward to um, January of 2013, mm -hmm. and I should back up and say the industry I was in was the photographic industry, mm -hmm. and so I had grown up in that industry, and I um, was very knowledgeable in photography, had my own cameras, I'd worked in a photography studio um, before I transitioned to the uh, manufacturing side mm -hmm. where I did all the social media. And that kind of played hand in hand. hand. Then. Yeah. yeah, they played hand in hand. And um, from there, Zach called me in January of 2012, no, 2013, and said, hey, I'm looking for a photographer to photograph my homes for my listings. Mm -hmm. And he said, do you know anybody? And I'm like, well, this girl, <laughs> right? This girl, I have a camera, yep. I can do this. Yeah. So I, Zach and I, photo I photographed homes for Zach and several other agents here in our market center, Mark Stewart and... Jason Massengale. Wow, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. So I did that for about, I don't know, two years. And when the writing really became pronounced on the wall that I needed to make a career change, my husband said, hey, why don't you call Zach and talk about real estate and going into real estate because um, I think it would be a good a good fit for you. Yeah. And it would be a good transition. You've been photographing homes for two years and now you kind of know what's going on with the market because you're working with these real estate agents. So I called Zach and he's like, yeah, that'd be great. But why do you want to get into real estate? Well, when I looked back and explored my history, when I got out of college, so I went to Drury, graduated in 1998, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And one morning I was sitting at breakfast, brunch, breakfast <laughs> with my parents. And I said, hey, Dad, I think I want to get my real estate license. So this is 1998. Mm -hmm. Wanted to get my real estate license then. Wow. And he, this is the time of newspapers, and he had the newspaper up like this, flipped it down, looked over it, over his readers at me, and said, "You'll never make more than thirty thousand dollars a year at that. Mm. So come work for me." And I did, and it was worse than thirty thousand dollars a year. Yeah. So, um, so my husband knew that. I did get licensed in 20, 20, 2005 let that license go, started photographing homes, and then in 2015, I did um, the 
independent study online classes. Yep. It took me six months because keep in mind, I was working a full-time job. I was photographing homes for the agents here in the office and I was studying for that test and I was raising two kids. Yeah. So it took me six months. I got it done, mm -hmm. right? Which was amazing. Um, passed, failed the test the first time, <laughs> yep. which was a big blow, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I was like, I already passed this test seven <laughs> or eight years or 10 years ago. I know this stuff already. I know this stuff. Um, took the test again and passed it and came over to the Market Center and I met with um, our team leader at the time mm -hmm. and Jim Bolin and signed, signed yeah. you know, signed all the paperwork and have been at Keller Williams since. So looking back when Zach had asked why you wanted to get in real estate the second time, was it the motivation of what your dad had told you when you were younger to think, man, now I want to go out and I want to prove that I can make more than 30000 in the industry? No, um, it was I wanted the freedom mm -hmm. and the independence of um, of real estate because yeah. it does it provides you the ability. The real estate industry can provide you the ability to create the life you want. Yeah, if it's done correctly. Yeah. Um. So that that's what I needed. I needed the I needed to have the ability to. Um, take my kids to school, pick them up from school, attend their class parties, um, do things as a mom and still support my family Yeah. instead of clocking in and out of a nine to five job. And if I had a child that was sick that day, then I'd stay home. I could still do my real estate activities from home. Yeah. So that was part of the motivation. And of, I'm not going to lie, the money was attractive. Of course. I mean. You can be your own boss. There's yeah. no cap on income. Why yeah. wouldn't you want to explore yeah. that? So um, the biggest thing is, so when I... I joined Zach's team. Okay. So I I had this huge limiting belief that I would never be able to pay the twenty three thousand dollar cap. Mm. I didn't because I was I had oh I'm only gonna make thirty thousand or yeah. or forty thousand or whatever that that number was that first year. I didn't think I could make pay the cap. Mm. You know what? That's so I pay I capped my first year <laughs> as a as a team. Yeah. You know as a as a buyer's agent on a yeah. team. And um, eventually, you know, Zach and I um, parted ways, and, and we're still really good friends today. Yeah. We, you know, we I still call him for advice on occasion, and um, both of your businesses have evolved and changed, uh -huh. in, since that has yep. started, so yep. it makes sense as it's changed too. Yeah. So I'm really grateful for Zach and, and Chris Russell, who was our team leader at the mm -hmm. time, um, because they both believed in me. Yeah. But I didn't have the belief in myself; they believed in me. So. So then why did you make the choice to join Keller Williams? Was it purely because of Zach? No. Um, I, during that six month period when I was research or studying for my class, I started researching brokerages. And the thing for me was that Keller Williams um, had a ton of information online, right? So I was 40 at the time and, or had just turned 40. And this was a major career change. And I knew that at that point in time, I was making this career change and I wasn't going to make another career change. Mm. This was it, right? Yep. Because I'd done multiple things from 20 to 40 and I was like, nope, I, this is where I want to be. This is where I've always wanted to be. It's been 20 years, almost 20 years in the making. Mm. And I'm finally doing what I wanted to do and that where, where my passion was. Okay. So... Um, I started following... The market center on Facebook and Chris Russell was doing all these um, selfie stick videos. Okay, <laughs> so if you go back yep. and look, there's selfie stick videos, and it was always exciting. The energy of the office was at the um, the education portion. Mm -hmm. I knew making the career change, I was going to have to be educated. That I did not want to be thrown to the wolves. Yeah, and say here, see what happens. See yep. if you can make it stick. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. And I and I know that there are, are some brokerages out there that say good luck, mm -hmm. and I know that there are others. To have some training and I just saw Keller Williams as the holy grail of training That's and awesome. if I was gonna make that change make that leap mm -hmm. I was I wanted the training so walk me through how your business has evolved so 2015 you were on a team mm -hmm. and then now afterwards you transitioned to an individual agent right what how has your business transformed during that time so I um, left Zach's team in 2016 okay is that right I think that's right Yes, I think that's right. 2016, yes, fall of 2016. And I went into the productivity coaching okay. group. Um, even though I had experience under my belt and I was a capper, I still chose to join the productivity coaching group. And that changed my business 
immensely. The numbers were up on the wall. We had this big whiteboard, and you know, it was whoever it was a leaderboard. Mm -hmm. Whoever had the most was number one, had the most volume, had the most contracts, had the most stuff going on. And that really motivated me to keep my name at the top. Yeah, of course. I was like, you know, I'm going to win. I'm going to win here. But it's really not winning anything except you're winning um, meeting your goals. Yeah. So You're winning and you're competitive within yourself. Within yourself, And you're using yeah. the other agents to help push you to go there. But yeah. it's all about how can you build the biggest life possible for yourself. Yes. So that was... Um, that was huge mm -hmm. for me, and I graduated, I guess is what you call it, okay. from productivity yeah. coaching, and I did productivity coaching for that full next year, so basically 27, fall of 2016 all through um, end of 2017, mm -hmm. and at the end of 2017, I got a MAPS coach. Cool. Okay. And yeah, I still talk to him today, you know, he's no longer with Keller Williams. Yeah. Um, I, uh, we become friends. Yeah. And... So I got a MAPS coach, and that really just took my business to the, to the next level. They talk about going from E to P or entrepreneurship to purposeful, purposeful, mm -hmm. and it became very purposeful. And I was lead generating every day, um, two to four hours a day. And in the first quarter of 2018, I had 14 deals under contract. Wow! Which was that's it's huge, huge yeah. because that's kind of a, a slower time, and. Um, I went to family reunion. Mm -hmm. That first, that was my first time ever going to family reunion, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own anymore. Mm -hmm. So I had been using a contract to close business and a contract and um, admin, yeah, which was great. Her business was growing as well as my business was growing, yeah, and it became very clear going into family reunion that I needed my own admin, yeah. So I took every admin assistant class there was as an agent. <laughs> And I got really weird looks yeah. when they say, oh, who do you work for? I'm like, well, I'm the agent. Yep. <laughs> and they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm learning what it takes to be an admin yeah. and what I need to look for when hiring an admin because I didn't, I don't have that skill set. Yeah. Um, I can do it. I don't do it well. So I... You were, you were training yourself uh -huh. for learning on what you needed to look for. Right. So then when you made that hire, you could properly communicate with them on what your expectations would be within that role. Yes. So I did hire my first full-time admin um, in 2018, mm -hmm. and she probably would still be with me today had COVID not hit. Yeah. So yeah. from 2018, I had added an admin, and then I added two or three buyer's agents, and some of us split ways. The, on the buyer's agents, we split ways just because where my business was at and where they wanted to be, it was not a good fit. Mm -hmm. We're still great. Yeah. Friends today, we can still talk, call and talk. There's no hard feelings. Um, it just wasn't where I wanted to go. was not where they wanted to go. Yeah. So, one, for example, one person wanted to really do um, investing. Well, I needed somebody who was going to sell mm -hmm. 30 homes to buyers. Leverage for you and be yeah. that buyer's agent yeah. and helping other clients, clients versus their own personal yeah. transactions. So those are the reasons why we split. Mm -hmm. um, and then COVID did hit. Yeah. And... Um, 2020 and we all went home and through COVID um, I had the 2020 was one of my best years ever uh, profitability wise yeah. and um, amount of volume and number of transactions and it was it was really good it was different but yeah. it was a really good year for me um, then there were challenges with that when trying to um, and I hate the word manage, but have a business partner or an admin, mm -hmm. I call them my business partners, yeah. that I worked with when they were at home and I didn't get to see them face to face yep. on a daily basis. Even with Zoom, it still wasn't, it's not like being face to face. And you were used somebody. to being in the office and you had that mojo right. together where how you were working. Yes. And it was just a difference of environment. It was a different environment. And then in August of 2020, my mom got sick and she eventually passed away about um, I don't know, 15 to 20 days after she got sick. And then after that, I came home and I worked, but I took about two and a half months off. And that's part of the reason why I love real estate. Like there are people in our market center that when I told them my mom had a stroke, they were like, just go, we'll handle your business for you. Okay. And that is amazing. I don't know of another brokerage where you could say, I have to step away and here's, I'm going to send you everything. 
and you just do it with it what you can and they say um well if i get them under contract i'm not going to take a commission mm-hmm. and i was like no 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 you can take all of it just no or you need this we need to support you and so i don't know of another business of any kind in the world that that you have that kind of support yeah. so uh, not just in real estate so i took those two and a half months off and i started realizing that I needed to come back to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't just sit on the couch and watch Netflix anymore. Yeah. It was like... Yeah. You needed to take the time. I needed to take the time. I was also homeschooling a child Yeah. <laughs> at the same time because Big he task. Yeah. was not functioning in public schools mm-hmm. because of COVID. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, the hybrid system wasn't working for him. So I brought him home and homeschooled him at the same time. And I also needed to go back to work because I was in my pajamas yeah. homeschooling a kid i'm like this is not who i am yeah so um when i started taking steps to come back into production i realized that um, my admin and i were not on the same page mm. and there were some she had some real fears she had some real limiting beliefs and i needed somebody to be in the office yeah and i asked her some very pointed questions and the answers I got told me that we it was time for us to move on yeah you know and and, and go our separate ways so since mm, November ish of 2020 it's just been me yeah um, I'm not in a point in my personal life or in my business where I'm ready to build a team again I still have kids at home and um, the biggest thing I took from the time at home with them and during 2020 was that they needed me more than I thought that they needed me. Um, I, my At the time, I think he was 15 or 16, he leaned his head over on my shoulder one day and he's like, hey mama, and I said, hey buddy, you know what? I think I'm gonna need to start working again. He goes, I hope you don't do it like you did it before because I really like having more time with you. I like you being at home more. Mm-hmm. So that right there, I was like, okay, so how, wh- how can I take my business, go back in production, be happy, for me, internally happy, because I do find some identity in work. Yeah. I think we all do. Yeah. Um, I And be the parent that my kids need to be and the wife my husband needs me to be. Mm-hmm. So I had to really learn to instill some boundaries in my business yeah. and in my life. And that meant maybe some less production, maybe two hours of lead generation three days a week instead of four hours a day, five days a week, and back-to-back appointments, and um, it meant scheduling my time off mm. first. That comes first. Which normally is not, not how it works. Mm-mm. You know, in our, one of our mottos, I think it's our motto here, is God, family, business, and when you put those God and family ahead of business, amazing things happen in your business. Yeah. So I took what I felt like was a big risk, to take a step back from business that I really wasn't. And you were setting those boundaries. I was setting the boundaries. There was a worry of what happened if I set those boundaries right. or what happened if I business. Right. And it's, you know, the whole boundary setting thing is difficult in per- personal relationships, but then when you take it and try to apply it to a business that has been your baby yeah. for five years, six years, then it becomes even, it's even harder. Yeah. But I made it work, right? You have. I made it work. Um, and along those same notes, Another really good agent and good friend of mine, Amy Malaya Kopit, said one day during Mega Camp, which was during 2020, yeah. she said, I just, I, I wasn't, I thought I was ready to come back and I wasn't ready to come back. And Amy said, at least, she's like, did you hear the, the speaker at Mega Camp talk about your juggling balls? And she said, your glass ball is your spirituality and your religion or faith, and the other glass ball is family, but your business ball is rubber. And if you drop the business, it will bounce. But if you drop God and family, it will shatter. Mm. And she's like, so you really need to think about which ball you're going to hold on to, which ball you're going to drop. I mean, that just gave me the chills. It doesn't it? It's like, that. it gives you, it does. It's very, it's very prolific and it's very thought provoking. So business will always be there. Yeah. It will always be there. So what my advice to people is if you have something going on in your life, don't stress about your business. Find that business partner within the market center or your office that can um, support you. Yeah. And that you can support them in their time of need because there will come a time when everybody has a time of need. Yeah. Um, 
So I must say, I've seen, I've known you since 2017, and that was really when you were starting the team building mm -hmm. phase. And to see you develop and transform from that Elise to this mm -hmm. Elise is, it's so fun and so amazing to watch because I think it happens to everybody mm -hmm. where, especially when they get in the real estate industry, they have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize the other sacrifices or the things they're saying no to mm -hmm. in the rise of success. Yeah. And I think COVID really put it in perspective for a lot of people mm -hmm. of where do I want to be? Yeah. And where I am, am I there mentally if my feet are there? Yeah. And normally that's not happening. And to see you transform to say, I'm going to set these boundaries mm -hmm. and I'm okay if business walks away because I know what's important to me. I think that is a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't have that realization or awareness around it. And so the fact that you were able to say, it's my husband, it's my faith, and it's my kids, mm -hmm. I'm going to make them a priority. You're like, wait, I have to go pick up kids. I have to take them to hockey. I have to do yep. this. Like, that is the important. That's been so amazing to watch. Thanks. It is amazing. Yeah. And, then, you know, I, I slipped into, I'm not perfect with the boundaries, right? <laughs> and I had a slip this week where I showed a house to my client's parents because he was at work, mm -hmm. right? And they have the flexible schedule. And I said, what do you think? And she's like, I think that we need to bring him back. Mm -hmm. So I texted the agent and said, when can I show it again this evening? She said, I have 545. I was like, okay, great, put me down. And then I realized there's that panic moment and I realized, oh, I have to take my son to hockey. Mm -hmm. So I picked my son up from school and I said, hey, here's your options. I need to show a house tonight at 5.45. You have hockey at 7. I know you like to be early. So the option is, I we leave here at 10, 5, 10 after 5, and mm -hmm. take you to hockey super early, yep. which he's comfortable with. Yep. And then I go back and show the house. Or you get in the car with me, and we go show the house. It's only 15 minutes, because mm -hmm. that was the time slot. And then I take you to hockey. And he was frustrated with me. Mm -hmm because I slipped back into that, not making him a priority and making my job the priority. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that, that's gonna happen, yeah. right? Sometimes you have to, it has to be fluid, it has to be, um, you have to be flexible in, in making, to make some of these showing times work. Yeah. Or sometimes with business, you have to make it work. And he said, just take me early. Because I knew that that would take the, he, that would take the anxiety off of him. He wouldn't yeah. be sitting in that car going, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. You know, so it was easier to take him early yeah. than it was to um, right along, and then he's, yeah, he's yeah. later than what he would he like, like to, to be, be even and, he's not late. and then his anxiety yeah. goes up. So, ninety-nine percent of the time, I adhere to the boundaries. There's those occasions mm -hmm. when it throws everyone for a loop in yeah. my family. Yeah. So, how do you reset yourself if you realize that maybe you did slip on your boundaries? Um, I really look back on it, self-reflection, and affirming what my boundaries are again. Just keeping those boundaries up front, affirming. This is, I'm not going to work. I don't have to work Saturdays. Mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest objections I hear to people when they say, when, when, when they find out I'm a real estate agent or a realtor, it's like, oh, you, I bet you have to work every night and weekend. I'm like, nope. In fact, I don't work nights and weekends. Occasionally, I may work a night or a weekend, and if I work um, a Saturday, then I take Monday off yeah, just to reset and to have that balance of time and keep that boundary. Um, if I, My advice to new agents is that if you're working 80 to 100 hours a week and you're working seven days a week, you need to stop. Mm. You need to take time for yourself. Go get a massage or a medic manicure or a pedicure or go play pickleball or go to the gym. Make sure you make that time, that time off a of priority because mm. it is, it will reset. I hear you. so many agents say real estate is a 24 seven job nope. and then they get upset when they're getting calls at 10 o'clock at night mm -hmm. or they're running like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I asked, did you set that expectation or did they? And normally they say, well, it's my clients. And I said, well, you're saying it's a 24 seven job. So what you're telling them is I'm always open. Yeah. Feel free to call. We can do whatever. And then when you're upset that you don't have those boundaries, Unfortunately, you did it to yourself. Right. So what I tell my clients, this I hit it up front. I just say, look, you can reach me via text 24 hours a day. If it's after 9 o'clock at night, probably not going to answer because I'm in bed. Because I get up at 5, 5.30 in yeah. the morning. And so if it's if you need to send me a text message because you have a question, I will, probably, I will read it, more than likely read it. Mm -hmm. If it's something that I can answer immediately, 
I might answer it or you'll get a text at six o'clock the next morning. Yeah. It's usually nothing urgent. Yeah. Right? So yes, there are urgencies within real estate, but this is not brain surgery. This is not rocket science. It's not going to blow up at nine o'clock at night. In fact, there's nothing I can do at nine o'clock at night yeah. except possibly calm fears. So I set that boundary up front. You are welcome to call or text me at nine o'clock at night. I may or may not answer because I'm probably in bed. Yep. <laughs> or at the ball field or at the hockey ring. Yep. Or something. And that's my off time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I can't remember who it was, but I was listening to a uh, video or Zoom call or something one time. And I want to say it was Chris Holler, but I'm not sure if that's who it was. They said, um, challenge you to put on your voicemail. I've reached Elise Ellis with Elise Ellis Real Estate Group at Keller Williams. Please leave me a voicemail. Da 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 da. And if oh, and if by the way, if this is after 6 p.m., I'm having um, time with my family. Leave me a voicemail. I'll call you back. Something to that effect. Yeah. But just set that boundary out. That hey, if it's after six, I'm with my family, and this is my family time. Mm. And I was like, oh, that makes me nervous. Well, that made me nervous, so that's something means I should do it. Yeah, and I did, and it works. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, you have a MAPS coach now. I do. Right? Mm -hmm. And so what does that relationship look like with you and your MAPS coach? Um, different mm -hmm. than a lot of the other MAPS coaches I've had. Yeah. So um, we still focus on numbers. We still focus on production. Mm -hmm. We focus on making calls or your lead generation and prospecting. Um, she also <laughs> hits really hard with limiting beliefs, blocks. Why are you stuck where you're stuck? What is? What are you telling yourself, your mindset? Mm -hmm. um, how to clear those blocks and release those blocks so you can become the best best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So she's coaching to the whole person. The whole person. Business. Not just the business. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. It's a very vulnerable position uh -huh. to be in. Yeah. Because in the business, it's easy to talk about. Yeah. Because that, for the most part, that is something that doesn't, normally cut deep mm -hmm. it's but whenever you see the whole other side of the person you can really truly find their why their motivating factors and what makes them tick the way they tick and I think if you only coach to one side then you're missing the other part of the person right that really was what will take their business forward I exactly and I have cried more on my zoom calls with her in the last three months I think I've been with her three months mm -hmm. than I have probably in the last five years <laughs> and I'm like you did it again. And she's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, oh, okay. It's probably a win for her. In a coaching call. I got someone to cry. Right. Right. We dug deep into it and found the issue. That's yeah. awesome. So. so, and then now you're focusing on real estate planning. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what real estate planning is. So it is, um, I don't, I hate to say this. It's, it focuses on the 55 plus category mm -hmm. and I don't like putting the number 55 plus on it because I'm 40, I'll be 48 in June. Mm -hmm. So 55 is just like right around the corner for me. And I don't envision myself at 55 downsizing and moving into a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I feel like that it should be revamped mm -hmm. in my head. Yes. I will work with anyone. Please don't get me wrong. Yeah. It can be first time home buyers all the way up to adult children, mm -hmm. uh, caregivers, to the person who is ready to downsize yeah. or to somebody who has lost a family member. It I, doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. um, I have this desire to work with the older population because um, a lot of times they don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. they, don't have a, they don't have anybody to advocate for them. They don't have anybody to help them through the process. And it's because of our, of our society. Mm -hmm. People don't stay within a 20 mile radius of where they grew up anymore, right? Yeah. We have, for example, my family, our family lives here. I have two brothers. One lives in New York City and one lives in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. My husband has a brother that lives here and he also has a brother and sister-in-law and four, four kids, their four kids that live mm -hmm. in Seattle. So we're all over, yeah. right? And I think that's pretty typical of the American family mm -hmm. now. We, no one really stays and has that um, intergenerational or multi-generational families here in the area. Yeah. So you've got, for example, I just helped a 91 year old lady sell her home that she lived in for 60 years. They built the property wow. 60 years ago. Her son, her only living blood relative, relative I guess she has other relatives, but yeah. her, her son lives in Australia. 
Wow. So, I mean, you know, I'm working with both of them in time differences. Anyway, so I, I like working with this niche because there are things that they don't necessarily know that they can put in place that would make the transition um, from their home into a smaller home or into an independent living facility or a luxury living facility easier mm -hmm. and to um, have all the correct legal documents in place yeah. for what their future wishes are. Yeah. Uh, there's no reason to go to probate. There's a big gap in having those documents. It is. And, it is. and it's never something anyone wants to think about right. because it's the hard conversations. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to that point of having to think about it, that's the last thing you want to do. Yeah. Um, I was in a real estate planner conversation and the presenter said, so which one of your siblings, or excuse me, your children do you like more? Mm -hmm. And the parent was like, oh, I love them both the same. And he goes, well, then why wouldn't you have this document made? Because if not, then you're going to have to have them fight, fight over it yeah. to figure out how you're going to do this. And there's a lot of demise in the in, within relatives when you have lost a parent and the, and the planning is not in place. And by planning, I mean, um, is there a trust? Is, if, if there needs to be, is there a trust? Is the trust correctly funded? Or is the trust, has the trust just been created and nothing's been put in the trust? Mm -hmm. I see that all the time, that we have attorneys in this area that will create a trust and then it's up to the to the person who's got created the trust to the, to the homeowner or to the, my client to put their home in the trust to put their cars in the trust to put their life and life insurance policy put the beneficiary as the trust mm. you know those type things that's not done yeah so the trust has been created but that doesn't mean it's been fully funded yeah. correctly yeah so you know are those I can come in and I say oh let me see your trust and they pull it out and I'm like, ooh, there's nothing been done. So yeah. we, we need to, then we need to make decisions. Do I send them back to, a, send them to refer them to another attorney to get things put in the trust? How, how, you know, there's all sorts of conversations that yeah. go along with that. And um, anyway. Yeah, sounds like there's a lot of awareness and um, education that has to go yeah. into it. And yeah. then once you're able to look into that, you're able to be their advocate. Yeah. Because a lot of the times they may not have somebody there to be their advocate. Or like you said, the kid or another family member could live across the country. Yeah. And how do you get that figured out? Yeah, and if they if there's not, for example, the other thing is if there's not enough property or enough things to have a trust, then maybe we should just do a beneficiary deed. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's a simple document at the title company can do ex create and execute like that mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things that could be done so I, I I love my old I hate to say it this way I love my old people <laughs> yeah, but I love my older people and, and I, I think it that in my mind you know it's not 55 plus yes there are some people at 55 who are ready to downsize out of their 4,000 square, square foot home into a 1,500 square mm -hmm. foot home and then there's people like my dad who's 75 and he is healthy as a horse not on any medication he is in his RV going all over the country, living three and four months at a time in Colorado or Florida or Arizona, and he still has his 3,500 square foot house here. Yeah. So, he, you know, it just depends on where they're at in life. Mm -hmm. And it's not a one size fits all. Not, not anymore. Yeah. Mm -mm. I love that. Yeah. Um, so, is what is your favorite thing about being a part of Keller Williams? Oh, it's the people and the culture. Mm -hmm. And, and still the education. I still yeah. learn things. I learn things every day. I went to a website class the other day, and I, I was like, wow, I can put a mortgage calculator on my website. So, That's awesome. Yeah. So it's just, it's um, coming, you know, come in in the morning, everybody's like, it, not just staff, mm -hmm. um, but other agents. Hey, how are you? Good. Good to meet you. Oh, can I help you with this? Or can you help me with this? And it's, yeah, it's just like a big family. Yeah. Well, thank you so much yeah, for your time welcome. today, and I really appreciate it. Stay tuned for next week's Red Chair Chat. Thank you.